you'll need one of these photos. You can get them from the internet. <clears throat> I want you to learn how to draw the sphere freehand. You could use a compass, and that's a way of, of fixing your drawing, and that's completely legitimate. However, I would really like to see you do a couple of pages worth of spheres like this. I'm going to show you how to hold your pencil. I'll be using a lithographic pencil, which is a darker blacker lead than the ones that you guys are used to. Uh, it also means that I can't use an eraser, which is a little bit of a problem for me. You hold the pencil like this, okay? Make sure that you hold it like this rather than like this because you use your wrist when you're drawing like this. It's much harder to make a circle when you're using your wrist than when you're using your whole arm. So you're going to be holding the pencil on the side and very lightly just so that a ghost of the image appears. And I want you to do two to three pages of these. Depending on where you print it from, these photographs will have different uh, qualities. Uh, some will be a little bit washed out, some will be a little bit dark. The best way to print the PDF that I have available for you is to print it onto photo paper in photo mode with your printer, or even to just look at it on your computer screen is actually better than looking at it on paper necessarily, but if you're in a classroom that's a little hard to do. Right. I want to go over the components of shading the sphere and talk about some of the elements that um, we're going to need to understand. Now, a sphere is basically a circle. And the circle underneath it has a shadow that's cast. And that the shape of that shadow is what's referred to as an ellipse, an elliptical form. An ellipse is basically a circle that has been turned on its side. And When it is facing you like this, it's a circle, right? But as it becomes foreshortened towards the, uh, towards the lens, see the shape it makes is called an ellipse, and it matches the shape of the shadow underneath the sphere. That's basically, there's a couple of easy ways to draw that, but this is another instance where you're going to have to practice it, and I want you to do two to three pages of this as well. So let me show you first. You can do it freehand. And that would be totally great if you can. The thing to keep in mind is that there's a horizontal line that runs through it. And so at each end, it has to be equidistant from the top and the bottom. And each end has to be a sort of like little C cup that, um, you know, like a bracket on a uh, parentheses or whatever. So you could conceivably start with a horizontal line and then connect it. To do this and that's a really good way to do it uh, but I do suggest trying to do it by hand now what I'd like for you to do is observe the elements of the sphere and the parts that are important. This is called the core shadow. This is actually the tones that come after the core shadow get lighter and lighter until you get to the edge where there is reflected light. The cast shadow is an ellipse. There's a background tone, there's a foreground tone, and there's a very background tone as well. 
once you've crested the core shadow, there are transitional tones that lead up to a highlight. And what I'd like to do is show you how to map all of those things so that you get a sense of where everything falls and also the proportions of how to map something accurately. So what you should probably do is watch me do it, then stop the video and do it yourself. And do that with the rest of this video, is to actually stop and draw with me and back up if you didn't get something. First of all, the tabletop, and this is an element of drawing that you need to really understand, is that things need to be parallel with the top and the bottom of the sketchbook of your, of your page. This sphere runs about halfway through the page on here, but I would like to make the sphere larger in this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise that line and I'm going to draw a light line across the whole picture. And I'm drawing it as lightly as I possibly can. Now the next thing is you need to see where the top of the sphere intersects with the top of the table. That will give you an idea of where to start. And also to get a sense of the proportions, you could even probably give yourself just a little line on the bottom to mark where that needs to go. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to use my whole arm and draw an approximation of a sphere. And I kind of have one there. Okay. Now, if it's not perfect, there are ways of cleaning this up later, and it'll be cleaned up as we define the edges. Now, the next thing I need to do is I need to see where the shadow of the ellipse intersects with the bottom of the sphere. And you can see that that core shadow comes just across the line where the tabletop is and it ends just after the ellipse begins. So I could actually give myself a little C-clamp and look at the direction. This shadow seems to tilt up slightly. I'm going to make it more horizontal to make it a little bit more perfect. And one of the things that you need to do also is how long is that elliptical shadow? How long is it cast? Well, if you measure the width of the sphere, you'll see that it's one and a half the width of the sphere. You could even do that with a ruler. So what I'm going to do is I'm using my pencil to measure one sphere width and then another half so it ends here. If I give myself a horizontal line, That'll give me an idea of where I want this thing to end. Then if I look at where the center of this thing is, the arc on that ellipse comes shortly after the, um, the uh, back edge of the ball. And so I can give myself an arc here and give myself an arc leading up to that. And I've kind of got a horizontal line. One of the things about drawing that I think is very important is to make sure that you pay attention to where uh, horizontals and, and vertical lines are, and they should always be straight with the edges of the page, even though they might not be like that in a picture, a photograph, or um, even in real life. People will think that your drawing is incorrect or off if you don't do that. Now, the next thing is I'm going to think about, oh yeah, there's a highlight, which I'm not going to indicate in here because it's hard to, to um, outline it. Um, transitional tones. Uh, after the core shadow, we've got the dark side of the sphere, the cast shadow. I'm going to flesh in some of these big tones and big values, and I'm going to use a piece of um, lithograph crayon. It comes in blocks like this, and I usually break it off. It even comes in super big chunks like this that you can use, uh, and even bigger ones that look something like this. Okay, If you look at the edges of these things, I've actually worn them down in such a way that I know what direction and how soft and hard of an edge I can get with them. So I suggest actually just trying to use these um, just to, to wear them down first. What I'm going to do is I'm going to block in the big masses of shadows. And then I'm going to redefine them later. So we might as well start with the background. And that's something that I tend to do is I tend to start with the background uh, whenever I am drawing and whenever I'm indicating in value structure. The reason why I do that is it's easier to figure out the whole composition in the drawing if you have nice edges from background to foreground. 
So I'm fleshing in some of the big values and I'm going very, very light. And I'm going to do that with almost everything that I have up here. It's going to be almost like a photograph developing over time rather than just coloring in and getting the value just right. And that way you can sort of check your values relatively against one another and you can keep going darker and darker as you need to and you won't score or rough the paper up so if you need to erase you can. Now keep in mind I'm not going to erase on this because I'm using an extra dark kind of crayon that I think the video camera can see a little bit better than, uh, than a pencil. Now you can see that most of my drawing, the line quality of the drawing has disappeared and it's starting to become all about shading. Now I'm going to uh, work out the tones and I want you to watch as I work out the tones and how I use this and to speed up the video so that you don't have to sit through the whole process and watch it forever. Now I want to make a point about filling in your drawing all the way to the edges because it'll look nicer if the completed drawing, each time you make a drawing, is supposed to look like a work of art. So if you take care of the edges, it's going to look more finished and it's going to look more like a work of art and it'll activate the entire picture and I think that's kind of important. Okay.
This is the highlight here. I'm going to leave that space empty and so the best way to do it really is to glaze over it with the small piece. Sometimes making small marks is nice and there's a little bit of a texture to the ball if you look closely. Uh, but I'm just going to do it very, very lightly. Um, I sort of scrub my way in towards the center. Could probably even go darker in some areas, but... Now there's some things that I really want you to be able to pay attention to and one of them is the fact that the as you come up near the edges it gets darkest in contrast where the edges sometimes meet closest to the object as you move away from the object the edges of your shadow will fade out and will also become fuzzy Sometimes in drawings there are these nice little things called soft edges and I guess I'm hardening that up a little too much. Right here where the, the values sort of cross over, that's called a soft edge. This is a soft edge where the object dissolves into the background. Um, and if you notice with this piece, all of the edges are defined not by any kind of lines but more by value structure. And so one of the things that happens as you're working on this drawing is you can actually see where you have made mistakes and where you need to sort of fix an edge and that kind of thing. And you can eventually turn this thing even more spherical uh, by keeping on working on it and not necessarily trying really, really hard to color uh, necessarily between the lines. You can really work out a drawing like this. Now, what I'd like to do next is show you how to do the same thing again, um, this time with a Sharpie marker, marker because I want to show you how to, um, how to do cross-hatching. When you are defining a form, uh, you can make marks to create value structure. So, for instance, if I was drawing a sphere and I put that sphere on a tabletop, well, I have you know, the basic elements of everything that I'm talking about, but I can use different kinds of patterns to work something out. So for instance, the background here, if I was to provide myself with a series of, horse, of vertical marks that terminated at the edges of the shape, right? And let's say I could even uh, just quickly indicate in the core shadow, then I went an opposite direction to define the volumes of the, uh, of the sphere. Now what happens with the sphere is light wraps around the edge and this is where the reflected light is and usually light feels like it's falling this way so the directions of your marks can actually indicate what direction the shadow needs to go or that kind of thing. So for instance if I put this on the horizontal tabletop and I start building across it to define the volumes and the edges of things and I just keep hatching and cross hatching repeating those patterns until eventually I can form the form through a series of lines that define edges um, and patterns that define edges that your eye blends together and that's called optical mixing and as your eye blends these uh, these marks together uh, the frequency of the marks defines edges of things And as you keep making the marks more and more heavy and layering them up, what you eventually start getting, it's almost like a halftone screen or uh, the dots in magazine photos. You can actually start building up through mark making.
Well, you get the idea. And you can actually build up an entire drawing this way of just about anything, any of the forms, and this is called, called cross-hatching. Now another way of thinking about it is if you were to um, think about the pattern or arrangement of the, uh, of the hatch marks in a way that sort of indicates the way that the sphere is moving uh, is called cross contour. And cross contour is a way of making the shapes of the marks echo a little bit the shape of the object to draw your eye out to the edges and make it feel like it's swirling, right? So you could use that for a rounded object and then uh, a flat ob object like a tabletop. You could use directional lines. And behind it, you could set up other kinds of lines that match the contour of that vertical wall. And it starts to set off patterns that are very regular. So if you want to be a machine, you can do that and really um, think about the direction of your mark making. And develop it even further. that's enough for you for right now and uh, we can talk about the um, other shapes in the next lessons. You should practice this as much as you possibly can stand to do.